Today's video is over complex numbers and De Mavre's theorem. We're going to take a look at an exploration that reviews what complex numbers are. And then we're going to talk about how to graph a complex number and take the absolute value of that complex number. Then we're going to take a look next at how to convert a complex number in trig form and how that relates to polar coordinates. Then we'll take a look at how to multiply and divide numbers in trig form. Then we'll look at a special type of theorem dealing with a complex number raised to the power of n called the mob race theorem. And then finally, we put it all together by talking about how to find the nth root of a complex number dealing with solving polynomial equations. So I'm going to start with the following exploration dealing with complex numbers, okay? <clears throat> it says, recall that I is square root of negative one and I squared is negative one. You're supposed to find the exact value of each expression below. So we have non-expression here you see on the screen and we're going to find the value of each of those expressions. While I'm working these, pay attention to what pattern emerges as I do these problems. So we'll start with i to the third power. So I'm going to rewrite i to the third power as i squared times i. And we know that i squared is negative 1, so negative 1 times i gives us negative Going down to i to the fourth, that's i squared times i squared. And we know this is really negative one times negative one, which is positive one. And i to the fifth is simply i to the fourth times i. And we know that i to the fourth is positive one, so positive one times i is positive i. So now we get to uh, more a little bit more complicated expressions here so let's take a look at i to the 18th power so i to the 18th power can be written as i squared to the power of nine using laws of exponents and i know that i squared is negative one so negative one to the power of nine is going to be negative one Now I'm going to take a look at i to the 77th power. What I want to do is rewrite it first as i to the 76 times i. And then I'm going to rewrite it as i squared to the power of 38 times i. And we know that i squared again is negative 1 and negative 1 to the 38th power is positive 1 times i is positive i i to the 100 can be written as i squared to the power of 50. And we know, again, i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 to the 50th power is positive 1. Now the exponents get higher. So i to the 23rd power, I'm going to rewrite it as i to the 22nd, or sorry, 122 times i. And that will allow me to write as i squared to the power of 61 times i. Again, i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 to the 61st power is negative 1 times i is negative i. And next is i to the power of 250. I can write that as i squared to the power of 125. Again, i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 to the power of 125 is negative 1. And finally, i to the power of 399. I'm going to rewrite it as i to the power of 398 times i. And I can rewrite that as i squared to the power of 199 times i. Again, i squared is negative 1. Negative 1 to the power of 199 is negative 1 times i is 
Now, if you have a calculator, you can check some of your responses. So let's take a look at I to the fourth power. So I to the fourth power. I'm gonna press menu for the calculator. So I have I to the fourth power. And we see we get positive one, which is the same answer we got here. Let's do I to the 77 and see if we got that correct. So I to the power of 77 is positive I. Okay. And let's finally do, let's do um, I to the 123. And we get negative i as the answer. So pretty much our calculator verified our responses. And so my challenge to you is to think of a pattern that will help you evaluate powers of i. There are many different ways that uh, this can be done, but you uh, come up with a pattern to see what uh, what you can do to evaluate each powers of I. We'll come down to the second part of the exploration. They want us to simplify the following expressions. This is just like um, algebra. So you're just gonna add like terms here. So two plus negative six is negative four. And then three I plus I gives us four I. So the value of this expression is negative four plus four I. You come over here and subtract the two quantities. You got five plus seven i minus negative five plus i. So five minus negative five gives us 10 and seven i minus i gives us six, positive six i. So this exploration helps review complex numbers from algebra. And that leads into uh, the first part of the lesson here talking about complex numbers. So a complex number consists of two parts. It consists of a real part and imaginary part. So as you can see here, the real part is considered A, and then the imaginary part is considered B, and it's multiplied by I. And here's a reminder there, again, I squared is negative one and I is square root of negative one. We, and we don't uh, normally write uh, the imaginary part times the radical just doesn't look nice, but here we denote it by uh, the letter I. And here, um, this chart talks about the conjugates. It's going to be very important that you know this moving forward because we're going to be using the conjugates um, in some of the uh, der uh, derivations of formulas. So if my complex number is A plus B I, then it's conjugate is a minus bi and vice versa. If the complex number given is a minus bi, then it's complex conjugate is a plus bi. The way I teach students the, uh, about conjugates is think about twins, okay? So the twins look exactly ex the same except they have different names. One is positive and the other one's negative, vice versa. Now we can do some examples. We're gonna uh, talk about First, how to plot a complex number and find its absolute value. So we're going to plot the complex number three minus four i. And if you notice, it's denoted by the letter z. Z just uh, is just a name for a complex number. And so to plot a complex number, you start with a. A tells you how many units to go left or right. So here. This number tells you if I move left or right, that's this number. And this number with the sign, the B tells you to move up or down. So we're gonna start with the three. So we go three units to the right, 
and then four units down because the four is negative. One, two, three, four. And there is where is z is located. So I'm going to put uh, z there. All right, and now we're going to uh, talk about how to find the absolute value. So to find the absolute value of a complex number, we're pretty much going to take the a and b and square them. So it's three squared plus negative four squared. So absolute value of z is 25 here. So the absolute, uh, so pretty much square root of 25 is five. So the absolute value of z would be five. If you look at this carefully, it looks like a formula that is familiar with, with uh, what we dealt with, with uh, dealt with in vectors, and you will discover that later um, in an exploration. So, if you understand that that uh, problem, here are some practice problems you can try. Here's the first one. Here is the second one. And here's the third. So now we're going to get to our second part of complex numbers. It's writing complex numbers in trig form. So you see here on the screen, we have a point plotted and it's considered P. And we're asked to write the complex number for the first part, write the complex number that corresponds to P. And so to figure out what this is, we got to figure out um, how far we went over to the left and how far we went down. So if we consider each tick mark one unit. So we went over one, two, three, and we went down one, two, three. So the complex number that corresponds to point P is negative three minus three I. Part two says find the absolute value z and describe what this number represents in polar form. So the absolute value of z, just like we found before. is given as negative three squared plus negative three squared. And absolute value z is given as that's going to be square root of 18 as the absolute value of z. And so we want to know, we want to talk about what this number means in polar form. And if you really think about it, this is the same formula we use when we compute at r. So the absolute value of z is really equal to r in polar form. Part three says use trigonometry to find the direction angle of the complex number in radians. And so if we take a look at where P is located, P is in quadrant three. So we're gonna utilize formulas that we used when we um, found direction angle for vectors, but only in radians. So theta here would be pi plus tangent inverse of here, this is our uh, y value and this is our x value. So negative three divided by negative three. And so if you evaluate that, you get theta equals pi and tangent inverse of that's one. That's gonna give you an angle of pi over four. And if you add those two together, you get a direction angle of Theta equals five pi over four. And part four says use everything from one, two, and three to write the complex number in trig form. Okay, so Z, if you think about this, Z is the same as um, writing. Um, X and Y in rectangular form to polar form. So this behaves as our X. And remember, X equals R cosine theta. So 
z equals square root of 18. Square root of 18 times cosine of our angle, which is 5 pi over 4, plus square root of 18 sine of 5 pi over 4 times i. And then we're just going to rewrite this in another form. And when we write it in another form, we get z equals, we're going to factor out the square root of 18 cosine of 5 pi over 4 plus i sine 5 pi over 4. And this is the number in trait form, which is equivalent to the number in polar form. <clears throat> so again, another important uh, result that leads us to how to write complex numbers in tree form. So now we have some significance with complex numbers and trig form or polar form, however you want to look at it. So for our complex number, remember it was written as A plus BI, but now we have our A, so our X really equals A and our Y it really equals B. So it's still the same conventions as before. And so in rectangular form, this is our complex number. To find, to find R, just take the absolute value of Z, which is the same as using the formula square root of X squared plus Y squared. And R e X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta. So of course, you'll need to remember your formulas from, you'll need to remember your formulas from from vectors in order to find theta, or you can utilize uh, both of these equations to solve for theta. Both of those will get you the same uh, answer as well. Once you get R and theta, you substitute those values in and you'll get the polar form of the complex number. So we're going to now do an example utilizing those formulas that you've seen on the last <clears throat> on the last uh, screen. So we're going to plot this complex number. Then we're going to write it in trig form. So based on, based on the information we were taught to plot the complex number, 6 minus 6i six will be in quadrant 4. So we'll go over 6 units from the origin. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and go down 6 units. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there is the location of Z. So that is where Z is. And so now we're going to compute our R value, okay, by finding the absolute value of Z. So that will be six squared plus negative six squared. And that gives us absolute value of Z square root of 72. So our R value is square root of 72. Now we're going to compute theta. So theta is based on the location of Z. So it's in quadrant four. So our formula to find theta would be two pi minus absolute value of tangent inverse of negative six over six and theta will equal two pi minus pi over four and gives us a direction angle of seven pi over four. And so our number Z written in trig form will be given as Z equals the 72 times cosine of seven pi over four plus I sine seven pi over four. So if you understood this example, 
Here's some examples you can try. There's the first one. Here is the second one. For this one to find theta, you'll have to utilize a calculator. Here is uh, the third example. So here, uh, these examples will help uh, again. You practice these examples, you'll understand how to go from uh, converting a complex number to truth. Now we're going to take a look at how to convert a number, a complex number that's written in trig or polar form to standard form. So first we're going to plot the complex number. So first we need to identify our data since we're plotting this on a polar coordinate system. So our five is our R and our three power of four is theta. So we're going to plot the point five comma three pi over four. So remember to plot a point. We go to three, uh, our angle three pi over four, which is located over here. And then are we uh, go five units on, on the direction angle. So that's five units from the pole on the three pi over four radial line. So that's we're going to count each circle as one. So one, two, three, four, and five. So that is where our point is in polar coordinates. So now we are ready to write this in standard form. To write this in standard form, you'll need to recall your unit circle trig based on the angle. So here Z will equal five times the, cos the cosine value at three pi over four. And remember that cosine at three pi over four is negative square root two over two plus I sine three pi over four, sine at three pi over four, which is square root of two over two. So when we rewrite this, we get Z equals negative five square root of two over two plus five square root of two over two i. And that's how you write the number in standard form. So remember standard form is a plus b i, and this is the form we have. So if you understood this example, here are some practice problems you can do. There's the first one. And here's another one. All right, next we're going to talk about products of complex numbers. So we got two complex numbers. These are generic complex numbers. So let's say that Z1 is written with some R and some theta, and Z2 is written as with some r and some theta as well. And let's assume they're not the same value for right now. Okay, so we're gonna multiply z1 times z2. All right, so if we take a look at this carefully, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to multiply my radii, which is r1 and r2 first. So that's gonna be r1 times r2. And then with the expression in parentheses, I'm going to FOIL, okay? I'm going to FOIL this with this. So, so I'm gonna first multiply cosine theta one times this expression over here in parentheses. So that's gonna give me cosine theta one, cosine theta two, plus I cosine theta one, sine theta two, then I'm gonna multiply the I sine theta one term to this uh, expression in parentheses and I get I sine theta one cosine theta two plus I sine theta one sine theta two.
after that, I have to, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I said I squared or not. So this is really I squared when I multiply this times this. So that's I squared sine theta one times sine theta two. Okay, so if you notice, we have I squared here and recall that I squared is negative one. So now we rewrite this expression as R1, R2, cosine theta one, cosine theta two, plus I cosine theta one, sine theta two, plus I sine theta one, cosine theta two, minus sine theta one, sine theta two. So there's the expression um, for the product Z1 times Z2. So part two says, use the sum and difference identities for sine and cosine to find a formula for Z1, Z2. So let's go back to this uh, result in part one. And I'm gonna move this up a little bit so I can have a little bit of room. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna underline certain terms and group them together. Like this term, cosine theta one and cosine theta two, and negative sine theta one, sine theta two will be written together. And then, of course, this term and this term will be written together because they have I in. So when I get ready to rearrange this, I have R1, R2, cosine theta one, cosine theta two, minus sine theta one, sine theta two, plus And if you notice, both of these have, have an I in common. So I'm gonna factor out the I and I have, and then what I'm gonna do is write the back term first, sine theta one, cosine theta two, plus cosine theta one, sine theta two. Okay, and once uh, you write those terms, then you will see some identities come about. Like if you pay attention to the blue expression, that's really cosine of theta one plus theta two plus in purple, you have I times sine of theta one plus theta two. And what you have here is a formula for the product of two complex numbers entering form. So that is the number, I'm sorry, that is the formula. That is the formula to write complex numbers in trig form. So you don't have to, you don't have to convert your complex numbers into standard form and then multiply them. The whole point is to multiply the numbers in trig form. So with that said, we're gonna utilize this formula. And so here are uh, two complex numbers we're gonna multiply. Okay, so just to remind you of what the formula is, remind you of the formula. All right, the formula is Z1, Z2 equals R1, R2 times cosine of theta one plus theta two plus I sine theta one plus theta two. There's our formula. 
So here's my R1, here's my R2, and here is theta one. and theta two. All right, so Z1 times Z2 equals, and you can utilize the formula, two times five times cosine of five pi over six plus seven pi over six plus I sine Five pi over six plus seven pi over six. So two times five is ten. And then when we add our angles here, we get cosine of twelve pi over six plus. I sine 12 pi over six. And when we get done, we get a result of 10 times cosine of two pi plus I sine of two pi. All right, so there's the number written in complex form. I'm, I'm sorry, in trick form. Okay, so this, this here is just a matter of identifying your uh, R values and your theta values and substituting them into this formula. So if you understand this example, here are some practice problems you can do using the same formula. All right, now we're going to take a look at quotients of complex numbers, how to divide complex numbers in trig form. Okay, so if you notice these are the same complex numbers, but this time we're going to, what we're gonna do is utilize <clears throat> division this time to see what that looks like. All right, so we're gonna find Z1 over Z2. So that's gonna be R1 over R2. cosine of theta one plus I sine theta one over cosine theta two plus I sine theta two. All right, now if you notice from algebra, we have an I in the denominator and you know that is not allowed because I signifies square root of negative one and you can't have a radical in your denominator. So that requires us to rationalize the denominator by multiplying by the conjugate. So the conjugate of the denominator is cosine theta two minus I sine theta two. And whatever we multiply in the denominator, we multiply in the numerator. So cosine theta two minus I sine theta two. So now this is going to require us to do some foiling in both the numerator and the denominator. So we now have R1 over R2. And my numerator, we're going to, again, we're going to foil the top. So we have cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, minus I cosine theta 1 sine theta two plus I sine theta one, cosine theta two minus I squared sine theta one, sine theta two in our numerator. All over. This is in the denominator that will be cosine squared theta two minus 
I squared sine squared theta two. Now, if you pay attention very carefully, we gotta take care of our I squared terms. So we have I squared term here and an I squared term here. So first I wanna start with the denominator. Since I squared is negative one here, that will um, change this, this um, negative sign into a positive sign. So we get this expression here. And from, trig and, uh, from using our trig identities, we know that cosine squared of an angle plus sine squared of an angle gives us one. So this whole denominator becomes one, which is very helpful. And the same, and up here, this I squared is negative one, so that will force this negative sign to become positive. So once we simplify all that, we get R1 over R2 times cosine theta one, cosine theta two minus I cosine theta one, sine theta two plus I sine theta one, cosine theta two plus sine theta one, sine theta two. That is the result of dividing these two. And then part two says, again, use the sum and difference identity for sine and cosine to find a formula for Z1 over Z2. Okay, so just like we did before, when we found the product of two complex numbers, we're gonna do the same thing, we're gonna group terms together. So these two terms will go together, and these two terms go together. And so now we have the result, R1 over R2 times, cosine theta one, cosine theta two, plus sine theta one, sine theta two. Here, again, both of these have an I in common. So I'm gonna uh, pull out the I, and I'm gonna write this back term first. So that's sine theta one, cosine theta two, minus cosine theta one, sine theta two. And again, we have some identities here. So when we simplify, we get R1 over R2. And the blue expression simplifies to cosine of theta one minus theta two. And the purple identity simplifies to I sine theta one minus theta two. And now we have a formula for dividing two complex numbers in trig four. So to divide, we divide our radii and subtract our angle. So now with that said, we'll utilize this formula in an example. So here are two complex numbers. And we're gonna divide these two complex numbers. So let me remind you of the formula we just developed Z1 over Z2 is given as R1 over R2. Cosine theta one minus theta two plus I sine theta one minus theta two. And so we're gonna go ahead and use our formula. So if you notice, both of our R values are one and here's our theta one and here's our theta two value. So we have one over one and I just write the one so you can see how the formula is used. 
and we have cosine of 40 degrees minus 10 degrees plus I sine 40 degrees minus 10 degrees And when we simplify that, we get um, we get an answer of cosine of thirty degrees plus I sine thirty degrees. And of course, you put the one there, and there's our answer. So again, just like finding the product, we find our radii or our values. And we found our theta values and just plug into the formula. So if you understand this example, you can uh, do these practice problems as well using uh, the formula for dividing two complex numbers. So now we get to this uh, exp uh, exploration here. Now we're gonna take a look at when we raise a complex number to a power. So now we're gonna use, uh, part one says, use the definition of the product of complex numbers in trig form to find each of the following. Okay, so this is our complex number here in trig form. So now we're gonna square this. So squaring this is the same as multiplying r times I'm going to write the expanded form first so you can see it. So R times cosine theta plus I sine theta times R cosine theta plus I sine theta. All right, so when we multiply these two uh, these, uh, well, when we multiply uh, these two quantities together, which are the same quantities, we're gonna be uh, utilizing the formula that we did for finding the product of two complex numbers. So R times R is R squared. And then we have, we uh, take our thetas and add them. So that's R squared times cosine of two theta plus I sine two theta. And then to find z to the third power, we're going to utilize this times r. So r squared times cosine 2 theta. Actually, let me uh, write it out so you can see uh, what we're actually doing. OK, so z cubed is the same as z squared. I'll write it like this so you can see. I'll write it under here. So this is z times z. So z cubed would be z squared times z. And so you have r squared times cosine two theta plus i sine two theta times r cosine theta plus i sine theta. And when we multiply those two quantities together, we get r to the third. And then you add your angles here. 2 theta plus theta is cosine 3 theta plus i sine 3 theta. z to the fourth is going to be z cubed times z. So we have for z to the fourth, the expression r to the third cosine 3 theta plus i sine 3 theta. plus r cosine theta plus i sine theta. 
And when we multiply those two together, r cubed times r is r to the fourth. And then three theta plus theta is cosine four theta plus i sine four theta. And hopefully by now, after doing three of these, three or four of these, you identify the pattern what's going on here. So I'm gonna do one more, or I'm gonna do the last one, z to the fifth, which is z to the fourth times z. And that's gonna be r to the fourth cosine four theta plus i sine four theta. times r cosine theta plus i sine theta. And when you write that out, when you multiply this out, you get r to the fifth cosine five theta plus i sine five theta. All right. So after doing that, we should establish the pattern because that's what part two wants us to do. It says use the results from part one to write an expression for z to the n, where n is a positive integer. So we're talking about when uh, n is one, two, three, four, et cetera. Here. So if you notice, each time we raise z to a power, the, uh, that same power appeared on r, so we know that we know for sure we have r to the power of n. So z to the n equals r to the n for sure. And then if you notice with your angle, that same number, that power that we're raising z to is also the coefficient of theta. So that is cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. And what we have here is the formula, the formula for raising a number to a power. And this is a very important uh, discovery because a mathematician came up with this uh, actual uh, formula here, which is coined as the Mavri's theorem. And this is the person who developed it. Okay, so when you're raising a complex number to some power, all you're doing is raising R to that power and multiplying theta times that power as well. And this only works when n is a positive energy. So let's take a look at using the Mavra's theorem with an example. So we're going to evaluate what this expression is. Okay, so it's three times cosine 60 degrees plus I sine six, uh, 60 degrees, okay? So, this is going to be uh, our power. Our n is our n is four. So this is n. This is our r value, and this is theta. So if we write our formula, let's write it. Our formula. So z to the power of n is r to the n times cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. And so here, this is so z to the power of four. Write that again. Z to the power of four is given as three to the fourth power times cosine of four times 60 degrees plus i sine. Let me color code these here. I'm going to color code these so you can see it uh, better. 
So cosine of four times 60 degrees plus I times sine of four times 60 degrees. And if we simplify this, we get 81, because three to the fourth power is 81. And then cosine at 240 degrees plus I sine. plus I sine 240 degrees. Okay, so there is the number. There's the number in trig form. So that's what Z to the fourth is in trig form, okay? If you're asked to write it in standard form, all you're doing is evaluating these at their respective values. So Z to the fourth is equivalent to really 81 times cosine at 240 degrees. And cosine at 240 degrees is, is negative one half. I'm sorry, it's not negative one half, negative square root of three over two. plus I times negative one half, sine at 240 degrees is negative one half. And then you will distribute that there. So Z to the fourth would be in trig form, negative 81 square root of three over two minus 81 over two I. So we have both, so here's the answer in, here's the answer in trig form or polar form. And here's the answer in standard form. So both of those are equivalent. Okay, so if you understood this example, you'll be able to do a practice problem similar to this. Okay, let's take a look at this one here. So here, we will want to convert this to trig form. You'll want to convert this to trig form and then um, use the Mavre's theorem, and then we'll convert it back. Okay, so first thing we need is um, R. So let's compute R. So R is given as negative one squared minus a plus negative one squared. And we know that that's equivalent to square root of two. Okay, so we found R. And now I want to figure out where this complex number is. So I'm gonna draw a complex number plane. So here's the imaginary and real. So negative one minus I is a complex number in quadrant three. So that's the location of Z, okay? So therefore my direction angle theta is given as pi plus tangent inverse of negative one over negative one. And if you actually evaluate that, you'll get pi pi over four, the direction angle. So now working, uh, evaluating this is the same as evaluating z to the fourth. So that's raising 
in trig form, square root of two times cosine by power of four plus I sine by power of four. to the power of four. Okay, so we're gonna use the Mavre's theorem to evaluate this. So z to the four is given as square root of two to the power of four times cosine at five times five pi over four. I'm sorry, not five, four. Four times five pi over four plus I sine five pi over four times five pi over four. So now Z to the fourth is, when we evaluate this, that would be four, because uh, this is a uh, one half power. So this will be two to a uh, two squared, which is four times cosine at five pi plus I sine five pi. And so we use, uh, <clears throat> so pretty much we have simplified this in trig, in trig form. So now if we wanted it in standard form, you would simplify all the way through. So you'll have four times cosine at five pi is negative one and sine at five pi is zero. So when you simplify this, you end up getting the value of negative four. So here's the number in standard form, and here's the number in trig form. And they're both equivalent. Okay, so we've done one where the number was written in trig form, and we used the Mavra's theorem, and we actually uh, wrote it in trig form and took it a step further by simplifying it in, into standard form. And then we did one here. That uh, number was actually written in standard form. And we converted to trig form, used the Mavra's theorem, and converted back to standard form. So if you understood that, you should be able to do these practice problems. So what you want to do is use the Mavra's theorem to evaluate each of these and then convert it to standard form. So now we get to. How all of this ties together. Complex numbers, trig form, uh, trig form, how do they all relate to each other? Well, this is related to back in what you study in algebra, solving polynomial equations. So we're going to find the roots of the equation using traditional algebraic methods. And then we're going to see how the roots of the equation tie into the trig form. All right, so here we have a standard equation here, x cubed plus one equals zero. So part one says find all roots to the equation x cubed plus one equals zero. So this requires us to solve this by factoring. That's uh, the sum of cubes. And so if you recall to factor the sum of cubes, so that x cubed plus a cubed so that would be x plus a times x squared minus xa plus a squared. That, that formula is from algebra. So applying that same formula to this equation, we get x plus one times x squared minus x plus one equals zero. 
And so when we solve x plus one equals zero, we get x equals negative one. So that's one of the solutions, or one of the roots, rather. And then we're gonna come over here and solve x squared minus x plus one equals zero. This is, uh, this, fact, this factor over here is irreducible or prime, so we'll need to utilize the quadratic formula. So here, let's write down our A, B, and C terms. So A is one, B is negative one, and C is positive one. So the quadratic formula, utilizing the quadratic formula, that's X equals, write it a little lower so I can have some room. So X equals, negative b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant all over two times a. All right, so negative b, so b is negative one, that goes here. And then b squared, which is negative one squared minus four times one, a times, which is A, A is one, times our C is also one, all over two A, which is one again. All right, so simplifying this expression here, we get X equals one, plus or minus, this is going to simplify to square root of negative three over two. And because that is, the discriminant is negative, that's gonna imply we have complex roots. So we have X equals one of our roots, or one of the roots rather, is X equals one plus I square root of three over two, and the other one is one minus I square root of three over two. Okay, those are our other two roots. So here we end up having one, one real negative root and two complex roots, or a total of three roots, which matches uh, the power in the equation though, so that's very important. Now it says write each solution in trig form. So for each X we got, we're gonna write it in trig form. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, start with X equals negative one. So here for X equals negative one, my R value is just gonna be one. And then my theta value, if you actually consider this uh, negative one plus zero I, our theta value here, since X is negative one, that implies that Y is zero. So theta here is zero radian. So here, our number in trig form is going to be Z equals one cosine zero plus I sine zero. I'm sorry, that's negative one. That's actually pi. It's pi. So one times cosine of pi plus I sine of pi. And to convince you that's correct, if you drew a coordinate plane here, so we plotted this as a complex number, Z will be right there. This X value, which will correspond to Z, we'll put it there. 
Okay, so it makes sense that our angle, our direction angle is pi. So this is the real, and this is the imaginary. Okay, so what we did was impose both the rectangular coordinate plane on top of the imaginary plane on top of the unit circle uh, as well. Then our next complex number is x equals one half plus square root of three over two i. So we actually drew that coordinate plane and I know it's very small, so bear with me. That puts this complex number in quadrant one. So that's where z, that z is. I'm gonna call that z2 and I'm gonna call this z1. Okay, so that would imply that r So if you, you square this and square this and add them together, you'll get one four plus three fourths, which is four over four, which is one. So here R is one as well. Let me write R here. So R is one as well. Theta, since this is a quadrant uh, one complex number, we're just gonna find the inverse tangent of <clears throat> B over A. So that's arctangent square root of three. And so arctangent square root of three is pi over three. Okay, so that number written in trig form One cosine pi over three plus i sine pi over three. Okay, and then finally, our last complex number x equals one half minus square root of three over two i. Okay, so based on the way this is written, this uh, complex number is a quadrant four complex number. So I'm gonna put Z3 there. And so I'm gonna compute R and theta again. So here R, R is going to be one again. And theta will be five pi over three based on the location of this complex number. Okay, so Z3 will write as one times cosine of five pi over three. plus I sine by pi over three. Okay. Those are our complex numbers in trig form. No, uh, I know that was a lot um, of work, but it was good because maybe there's a pattern that emerges from this. So Z1 is this. Z2 is this and C3 is this. So let's, uh, let's see what uh, pattern emerges from all of this. So it says, use the results from two to determine the relationship between R and theta in trig form. So if you notice that in all three complex numbers, our, our value is the same. So we know for sure one, one thing is R is the same. in all 
three Z values. We know that's true. Now let's take a look at the angle, theta. Let's see what's going on with theta. So I know they're written out of order. There's no specific order you can write these numbers in, but I like to start with, I like to start with the smallest angle, which is pi over three, then go to pi and then five pi over three. So if I notice that from pi over three to pi, I need to add two pi over three, okay? So if I add two pi over three, okay, to pi over three, I get pi. And then I'm going from pi to five pi over three. So if I add two pi over three again, I get the five pi over three. So what I notice about theta, theta is increasing by two pi over three. Now, in all three, in, uh, in, the, in all three, well, I don't want to say in all three Z values because that doesn't make sense. It's just in, theta is increasing by two pi over three uh, for each, yeah, for each Z value. I do want to say that. Now, let's take a look at this angle here. If you notice, very carefully, if you notice in two pi over three, there's some significance to two pi over three. If you look at the denominator, this denominator is actually the same as the power in the equation. And so we could really say that all of these roots differ by two pi over two pi over n. So they're all, all of these roots differ by two pi over n, where n is the power on your polynomial. That's a very important relationship because that results in these definitions, the nth root of a complex number. So for the nth root of a complex number, <clears throat> we have really this circle here. So the unit circle really comes back into play, okay? But if you take a look, this is not just any unit circle. It depends on what your R value is, okay? So the nth root of R is the radius from the center of the circle to the edge of the circle. So we have the definition of the nth root of a complex number, and it says the complex number U equals A plus BI is the nth root of the complex number Z if Z equals some power, that, that complex number raised to the nth power, which follows the Mavra's theorem. And then the, down here talks about how to find the nth root of a complex number. For any positive integer n, the complex number z equals r times cosine theta plus i sine theta has exactly indistinct nth roots given by this formula. Okay? And yes, it's a very, looks like it's a very complex formula, but it's, it's really not. And so um, what we have to do is we need to make sure we find R and find our theta value in our, in our N value. So K is uh, going to uh, increase by one every time. So we're, with that said, we're going to do some examples using the nth root of a complex number. So first uh, example is we're going to find the cube roots of a thousand. Okay, so we're going to find the cube roots of a thousand using the nth root of a complex number. All right, so first thing we need to do is get r and theta. So we have r. So we're going to write 1,000 as a complex number. So that's really z equals 1,000 plus 0i. After we do that, we need to find R. So R 
we know is going to be based on the way it's written, it's going to be a thousand. All right. And then we'll need to draw our coordinate plane. And then we'll figure out where Z is located. So here's the imaginary. And here's the real. And so um, based on the location of Z, Z is somewhere over here. Okay. Z is somewhere over there. So that will imply that theta is zero radian. So now we're ready to use our formula for the nth roots. And the way I wanna do it is since the formula looks complex, I'm gonna write out the cube roots, okay? So here we're gonna start with Z zero. So we're gonna start with the first one. So Z zero and cube roots imply that N is three. That's another thing you have to also pay attention to. Cube roots means n is three, since we're finding uh, three roots. Okay, so z0 equals the cube root of 1,000 times cosine theta plus, so our theta value is zero. So zero plus two pi times zero Actually, let me do it like this. Zero over three plus I sine zero over three. That's the first root. So that's gonna give us Z zero equals 10. Okay. Our next root is cube root of a thousand cosine zero plus two pi over three plus I sine two pi over three. So when we simplify this, I'm gonna write it under here. So we get 10 times cosine two pi over three plus I sine two pi over three. And that's gonna give us Z one equals negative five plus five square root of three over two i. Then our next root, z2, is cube root of 1,000 cosine of zero plus four pi over three plus i sine four pi over three. zero plus uh, four pi over three, excuse me. And we get 10 times cosine of four pi over three plus I sine four pi over three. And that's gonna give us Z two equals negative five minus five square root of three over two i. And then our last one, actually we have them. We have all three of them. One, two, three. So here are our three roots. So the Q roots are a thousand are 10 times 
10, negative 5 plus 5 square root of 3 over 2i and negative 5 minus 5 square root of 3 over 2i. Those are the cube roots. Okay. And we'll do another example so you can kind of get an idea of how the formula works. So now we're going to do the fourth root of i. So we're going to find the fourth roots of i. So fourth roots will tell us, since we, uh, well, since we're finding the fourth roots of i, we had n equals 4 here. Our z is 0 plus i. And that will imply that r equals 1. And then we have to about our complex number, see where it's located, because that's going to dictate our direction angle. OK, 0 plus i puts the complex number here. OK, so that will imply that theta equals pi over 2 as our direction angle. All right, since we're looking for the fourth roots of i, we're looking for four roots using the formula. So we'll go ahead and compile those. So let's start with z0. z0 equals the fourth root of 1 times cosine of pi over 2 over 4 plus i sine pi over 2 over 4. <clears throat> so when we simplify that, we get 1 times cosine of pi over 8 plus i sine pi over 8. Okay, and then this right here, you'll need to put in the calculator. Uh, this is an angle that I'm not familiar with off the top of my head. So this is one of those you'll put in the calculator and we'll find that, um, we'll find that um, value later. So our next root is Z1. Z1 is the fourth root of one times cosine of pi over 2 plus 2 pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 2 plus 2 pi over 4. And so that's going to equal 1 times cosine. So when you add the numerator together, you're going to get 5 pi over 2, which is going to give you 5 pi over 8 plus i sine 5 pi over 8. Right? And so you should be able to identify the pattern after a while. So if you figure out what to add from this angle to this angle, then you can really generate the rest of these without utilizing the formula. So see if you can kind of identify the pattern. If you can't identify the pattern, then just keep using the formula, okay? So here, the next one will be the fourth root of one, cosine over two plus four pi over four plus I sine pi over 2 plus 4 pi over 4. And when you simplify that, you get 1. This numerator, when you simplify it, you get 9 pi over 2 over 4, which is going to be 9 pi over 8 plus i sine 9 pi over 8. 
And then we need one more root, Z3. And Z3 will be the fourth root of one times cosine of pi over two plus six pi over four plus I sine pi over two plus six pi over four. And when you simplify that, you get one cosine. Your numerator is gonna be 13 pi over two divided by four, which is 13 pi over eight plus I sine 13 pi over eight. So here are our four roots of I, okay? Four roots of I. Now, when you get ready to use the calculator, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, write these correct to three decimal places because they're not gonna be exact. And so I need to make sure my calculator is in radian mode. And it is in radian mode, so I'm good. So I'm gonna go to my calculator. So I'm going to type in cosine of pi over eight. Move this over a little bit. Not a nice number. Okay, so, so I'm gonna do menu number Convert to decimal. So I'm going to take that, convert that to a decimal. Sorry, having some technical difficulties here. Okay, so menu, convert that to a decimal. So I'll correct to three decimal places, cosine at pi raised 0 0.9 to 9.24, okay? So this right here is 0 0.924 plus sine at pi over eight, So let me delete that and put sign. And then we're gonna take that, we're gonna convert it to a decimal. So 0.383. Okay. So that's one of the uh, roots in standard form. So as you can see, you're gonna have we're gonna have to do this for the uh, same thing with the blue, the pink, and the uh, the purple and the pink. So here are the fourth root. Here here they are. So here's one of them. So this is one of them with the decimal equivalent. And I'll leave this part to you to convert to standard form. So here's the second root. Here is the third root. And here's the fourth one. So if you notice that the number of roots that we get. So when we are counting, uh, uh, counting, when we're counting starting at zero, you always want to go one less than the number of roots you're supposed to get. So here n equals four. So that means my, when I get to my third root, I need to stop. 
because after after my third root, the uh, the uh, roots start to repeat themselves, um, going around the circle. Okay, so I know that was quite a bit. Okay, but if you uh, somewhat uh, understand that, you can apply uh, this to these two practice problems. Okay, so just make sure you com uh, convert it to trig form first. Remember, you got to get your R and your theta. And then if you notice, you start plugging into the formula. And each time you get a root, what you're doing is you're adding um, a multiple of two pi. You're adding a multiple of two pi to the direction angle to get the next root, if that makes sense. So you may have to go back and reference the practice problems to kind of understand how to do uh, these practice problems here. And that gets into uh, the last couple of examples here. Uh, we're going to be solving equations using the nth root of a complex number. So we have x cubed minus 27 equals 0. And we're supposed to find the solutions or the final roots of this equation. So the first thing you want to do is you want to rewrite the equation by isolating x cubed. So x cubed really equals 27. So what we're doing is really finding the cube roots. So we're finding, we're finding uh, three roots. So it's three roots of 27. So there are three roots of 27 we have to find. Now you can easily solve this using algebraic methods, but the whole point is to use uh, the formula for the nth root of a complex number. Okay, so that will imply several things. So first, we'll need to find out what this uh, number is in trig form. So 27 is 27 plus 0i in uh, standard form. r is 27. And of course, you need to draw your coordinate plane. If you draw your coordinate plane, twenty-seven plus zero i is somewhere on this axis here. So that will imply that theta equals zero radians. All right. So we have the information we need. So now we're ready to start compiling our roots. So z zero. Let me write it here. And all I'm going to do for these two examples is just write it in trig form, and I'll leave it to you to write it in standard form, either with or without a calculator. So here, n is 3. So that's our n value. So it's cube root of 27 times cosine of 0 over 3 plus i sine 0 over 3. So that's going to be equal cube root of 27 is 3. So 3 times cosine of 0 plus i sine 0. I'm going to leave it like that. Next root is cube root of 27 cosine of 0 plus 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3. So that will imply that z0 equals 3 times cosine 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3. Z2, and this is our last root because remember, once we get to one less than n, we are uh, done. So cube root of 27 times cosine of 0 plus 4 pi over 3 plus i sine or 0 plus 4 pi over 3. 
and I wrote uh, the incorrect number here, that's Z1. So Z2 is three times cosine four pi over three plus I sine four pi over three. And those are our cube roots or where our three roots of 27 are cube roots of 27. So here they are. So here's the first one, here's the second one, here's the third one. Sorry about that. All right. Once you do enough of these, it'll start to make sense. Here's our last example. X to the fourth plus one plus I equals zero. So what you want to do is first So uh, isolate the x, um, the uh, x term. So you get negative one minus i. So this implies the four roots. We're looking for four roots of negative one minus i. Okay. So here's our n. Okay. So we need to find out what. Z is, so Z is negative one minus I. R is square root of two. And theta is the location, is the direction angle based off the location of Z. So negative one minus I is a quadrant three complex number. And so when you compute that, you get an angle of five pi over four, direction angle five pi over four. So now we're ready to compile the roots in trig form. So starting with our first roots, Z zero. So that's fourth root of square root of two. Yes, the fourth root of square root of two. times cosine of five pi over four over four plus I sine five pi over four. Which is equal to really, I mean, the best way you can simplify this, that would be the eighth root of two times cosine five pi over 16 plus I sine five pi over 16. Our next root is gonna be, I'm just gonna go ahead and simplify this. Uh, we know it's gonna be eighth root of two cosine five pi over four plus two pi over four plus I sine five pi over four plus two pi over four. And so we get eighth root of two. And if we simplify this up here, that's gonna give us 13 pi 13 pi over four divided by four. So that's gonna be 13 pi over 16 plus I sine 13 pi over 16. And so if you notice from here to here, we added eight to uh, get to 13. So like I said, you wanna utilize some patterns here so that way you don't get too bogged down in using the formula. So Z2 is going to be the eighth root of two cosine. If we add eight to get to 13, we're going to add eight again, and that's going to be 21 pi over 16 
plus I sine 21 pi over 16. And then the last root, Z3, is going to be the eighth root of 2 cosine of 29 pi over 16 plus I sine 29 pi over 16. And we have found the, the four roots of negative one minus I. It's, uh, that one there, that one there, that one there, and that one there. So again, you wanna, again, utilize some patterns to help make, make uh, finding these roots easy. All right, so there are the four roots, okay? And here are the practice problems that go along with this, okay? This is all to the world of complex numbers and the Mavre's theorem and finding nth roots of a complex number and solving polynomials. Make sure you go back and review some of these notes and make sure you understand how to utilize the formula.